situation politics and their terrain that's seeking drastic change. I think for, especially for the younger people in the room, how do you believe that the working class left alternatives could have changed South Africa for the better? Um, and how have lived reality to actually change them? I mean, that is the book, but if you could just summarize that for us. That's a great, that's a great question, thank you. Um, but I do want to just start off with your comments around sort of embodying this politics. Um, because I think for many of us shaped in the mass resistance of politics, I consider myself part of the last generation of anti-apartheid uh, activists and mass politics. Um, from the 80s and the young person growing up in the cauldron of all of that. But I also consider myself part of the fourth generation of Marxists that come out of the 19th century, um, living in the present, uh, trying to think with those resources about our life world and so on. And it comes down to living these beliefs. Okay? Um, and that is what marked, if you like, um, the left tradition politics that came through in the 19th century, the 20th century, you lived your beliefs, okay? It wasn't just abstract thoughts and ideas and so on. You gave your life to it. You surrendered to it. Um, I use Shea Guevara as one example in the book. And Shea Guevara had a very different conception of love. It's what I would call maximalist love. Uh, where he was willing to even wipe out himself uh, in the cause. Okay? I, I disagree with that um, because in Marx there is this idea that if you want to change the world, you've got to do mass politics. It's even in the Communist Manifesto. You've got to organize, you've got to build mass power, and so on. And that's a harder part, actually. Okay? Um, and so, yes, living this politics, going down this road of connecting with people at a very elemental level. They need for water, they need for food, they need for homes, etc. It's crucial to living this politics. Um, it's, it's grounded in that kind of praxis. Praxis is another important idea related to this which I want to explore. Because the, the generational politics that we are in right now, the shift to a new generation, this idea of praxis has been lost. Praxis is about unifying theory and practice. It is one crucial element of, if you like, a way of thinking and being in the world. Without praxis, we cannot transform the world. Without a, a praxis that is grounded in what I've been talking about, a deeper appreciation of the dynamics of capitalism, uh, a holistic analysis, but also a praxis that is working with this warm stream of radical thought, what Ernest Brock called the warm stream, the ethics of how we live in society, how we engage in struggle and so on. All of this comes together around praxis and what you do in the everyday world to change it. So for me, this issue of body, this issue of living belief, the cornerstone for it is the notion of praxis. Okay. And so I'll, I'll leave that point. I mean, your other question was around the National Liberation Imaginary. Now this imaginary was never singular. If you look at the Freedom Charter, it allowed for, if you like, different impulses to coexist in it. It authorized a Sovietized imagination. It was a product of its time. Uh, and so there's a strong state centrism there. If you, if, you, if you read it again closely and if you kind of locate it in the discourses that have come since, social democracy 
also inhabits that imaginary. So the idea of a welfare state, the idea of redistributive Keynesianism, and so on. The third uh, sort of aspect of imaginary in all of this is a revolutionary nationalist one. Okay? But also very state-centric, despite the idea of you know, people's power kind of shot through in the Freedom Charter, shot through in the Reconstruction Program, inspired by Madiba's Long Walk to Freedom, street committees, grassroots power and politics. But that's the kind of imaginary that we've had. And in the Communist Party, after the collapse of the Soviet Union, there was an attempt to tackle that imaginary. And that's what attracted younger people like me into the Communist Party. The Soviet Union had vanished. And those of us who were going into it were excited that we could reimagine everything. We were now at a new frontier of thought, of praxis. We could rethink everything. Joe Stowell's The Socialism Failed ignited that. It was a bold attempt, rather late though, because you know, they journeyed with the Stalin and the Soviet Union for a long time. But post 1990 became necessary to kind of think critically about the Soviet model. And that opened up a very important moment of left discourse in South Africa. There was a fluorescence of thinking. It was an exciting moment. The Communist Party doesn't think today. But at that time, in the 90s, it was thinking deeply, creatively. And my generation was in there trying to figure out, OK, where do we take South Africa in terms of a socialist imagination? And there were important ideas, and so there's a whole theme here around the democratic imaginary uh, that I contributed to inside the Communist Party. So it didn't go far enough in terms of, if you like, leaving behind the state-centric imaginary of Soviet socialism, social democracy, or revolutionary nationalism. He didn't take it on sufficiently. So, as a result, in the transition, you kept on getting, if you like, a ghostly presence of this idea. So after Taubo and Becky and his faction choose the neoliberal path, uh, and the horses bolting, opening up this economy, suddenly in the 2000s they're talking about a developmental state. And that idea actually comes from the Communist Party. Okay? And they suddenly realize, okay, we're going to be more strategic about how we position the South African state. But again, it's, a, it's, it's haunted with the state-centric imaginary. If you read the document that comes out of the Polokwane Conference, there's a continuity of this developmental state imaginary. If you listen to the breakaways uh, from the ANC liberation movement, the EFF, for the EFF in its performative politics, nationalize everything and we'll be living in a utopia. It's again this lazy state model thinking. Okay. What some of us were doing inside the Communist Party, which again wasn't visible to the public, was saying, let's rethink property relations. Is it just all about state ownership and therefore you have a new society? That's too simplistic. Okay. So we were saying, the one lesson you've got to learn from history from Soviet socialism, social democracy, revolutionary nationalism, is that if you're going to build a new society, you have to do it bottom up. That's a fundamental lesson that we learnt and we concluded on as a younger generation in the Communist Party from this critical reflection. And that meant that we've got to rethink property relations. We've got to think about cooperatives. Cooperatives are a socialized form of ownership. Okay, they are not business-centered enterprises, they work with the logic of meaning. We've got to think about democratic planning. We've got to think about planning that, not kind of master plans in the Soviet sense, where you, you have this totalitarian notion of planning, but you have bottom-up planning. Participatory budgets, so citizens can shape priorities and needs. You think about, uh, Democratic public utilities. So it's not nationalization 
And the way the EFF talks about it, the useless state that we have that's dying is going to now run our society. No. Democratic public utilities that are embedded in rationalities of socialization. So if you look at Transnet, the debate some of us were having, you'd involve commuters in Transnet. You'd involve workers that work in Transnet in defining what Transnet is all about. It's a democratic public utility. Okay? Together with the state bureaucrats, but they are shaping its rationality to meet the needs of society. The commons is another big idea of rethinking property relations. And a lot of the ground, well, this ground for me, we started breaking it to some extent in the Communist Party, uh, but took it further after the Communist Party. In our work around food sovereignty, uh, working around seeds, uh, working around water. Uh, working around land and thinking about all these things, the ocean as a commons. These are ideas um, that were imminent and that were part of that renewal discourse that were happening. And it had potentials for different directions for policy, different trajectories for where the society could go. But of course, um, this was eclipsed. This was happening in the margins. And the nationalists that were hegemonic, they were constantly eviscerating this radicalism as part of the passive revolution. They were co-opting Kusati leaders. They were co-opting the Communist Party leadership. They were de-radicalizing discourse to the point where post-apartheid South Africa became equated to normalizing the de-racializing of monopoly capitalism and globalizing. That became the horizon of international liberation. That became what emancipation was all about. Okay? And it hasn't worked.